Praise God. Adults, you can grab your Bibles if you would. Lift your Bible with me. Say this out loud. This is my Bible. I have what it says I can have. I do what it says I can do. I am what it says I am. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm about to receive the incorruptible, the indestructible, the ever-living, the ever-producing seed of the living God. Father, I confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, my body is awake, and from this moment forward, I'll never be the same. I'll never, 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 I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5 tonight, and uh, I want to talk to you tonight on the subject of faith. Yay. How many, do you ever watch any of the Olympics on TV or any of the pro ball players or, or anyone like, you know what, you know what makes them who they are? You watch pro ball? Ice skaters? Yeah. And you know why they're, why they're the, in the pro position? or the, especially those that are in the Olympics, they have become masters of the basics. They have become masters of the basics. You know, uh, I was teaching school here in Mustang, and I um, was teaching eighth grade uh, uh, gym class. And uh, the boys came in, and uh, what we did that day, we just uh, practiced the basic drills of basketball. Just shooting the hoops and standing up just the basic things, the layups and the different shots, because that's where you become proficient, practicing the basics. In 1981, we started studying the subject of faith, and I never stopped studying it. I I think I do something about faith just about every single day. If if I'm not reading it in the Word or reading a book or listening to a CD, uh, reading the Bible, I'm ministering it to myself constantly, just rehearsing over and over and over again the basics of the fundamentals of faith. Well, just uh, one day this week, I I looked at this scripture in Mark chapter 5, and I saw something again that just dropped it down on the inside of me about the basic fundamental of faith that we all learned uh, from Brother Hagin when we went to Ramah. And it's the basic principle that he got from Mark 11, 23 and 24, that the Lord told him that you're going to have to talk about people and their words three times more than you talk to people about their faith. He said, people aren't missing in any area of faith. Most people have the amount of faith, you know, everybody that's born again has the measure of faith, right? It's given to you. Then you develop it. And the people aren't missing it in their faith. If you have faith in one scripture in the Bible, you can believe God for anything. And that scripture is simply this, Genesis 1.1. If you can believe that scripture, you can believe anything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Are you guys all comfortable? You all warm? Scott, could we turn this air, I think, is, I don't know, check this and see how hot it is. Turn it, make it cooler in here, and that one in the hallway. I'm cooking You thought you were the only one? Man, I'm beginning to, where's the air conditioner? Thank you, Scott. In Mark chapter 5, let's begin reading in verse 20. And I may read several scripture, but there's something I want you to see here that's very, very vital if you are going to uh, overcome obstacles and tests and trials in your life. How many of you live in this world? Anybody live in this world? This side over here lives in the world. This, I don't know where you guys live. But if you live in this world, even though you know Jesus and even though you're a person of faith, you've learned that you're going to have to, you're going to have tests and trials. Now, God doesn't send them, but you are going to have them. You're not of this world, but you are in it. And you are going to have problems that come. And sometimes they seem to come daily. You might overcome something today, and then tomorrow there'll be something different. But if you use faith, it'll take care of every situation. 
I learned that many years ago. David fought Goliath, and he had practice. He fought the lion, and he fought the bear, and he killed the lion and the bear, and he practiced praise and worship, and he, he sang unto the Lord. He knew the presence of God, and then it was time to fight Goliath, and the whole congregation of the church was standing up on the hill in fear. And then David, the teenage boy, came with his bag lunch. So well, I'll fight that giant. Why? Because he knew his God. He knew how to use what he had been taught. But there's something interesting about David is that he went down to the brook and he picked out five stones. But he only used one stone for Goliath. And he still had four more stones. But then if you go on to read in Chronicles, you'll find out that Goliath had four brothers. So just because you kill Goliath or you pull the lion down or you pull the bear down, it doesn't mean you're finished. This is not an arrival. It's a journey. It's a life walk. This is the way that we need to live. And so we need to remind ourselves that when that next giant comes, and I know you don't want to hear this, but there's one coming. <laughs> And when he comes, it depends on the onslaught of what is going to happen. That giant came and threatened David, but David said, I killed the lion and I killed the bear, and you're an uncircumcised Philistine, and I'm cutting your head off. That's all David said. David didn't run in terror. He didn't run in fear. He didn't go get the prayer warriors. He didn't go get counselors. He didn't have a staff meeting. He already knew how to handle the situation. Amen. And you have to be prepared. In verse 20, Jesus departed, and he began to publish in Decapolis how great things, they began to uh, publish what great things Jesus had done for him, this man that got delivered. And all the men marveled. And when Jesus was passed over again by the ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was near unto the sea. Now watch this. This is where I wanted to get you. Verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, church going person, ruler, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell down at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little girl lieth at home home, or lieth at the point of death, I pray thee, come. Now what? Listen to what Jairus said. He told him the circumstances. There isn't a problem with us, to, you know, hey, this is happening. This is going on. I've got an attack in my body. There isn't anything wrong with that. Uh, many times, you know, if we come to prayer, or you need a prayer, we hand out a prayer cloth or whatever, we need to know what the problem is. There isn't anything wrong with going to the doctor, finding out what the symptoms are, finding out what's going on in your body. Go ahead. But now watch what Jairus did. He said, I pray thee, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now listen. This was his faith talking. He said the circumstances, but then he spoke his faith. Now watch this. Back it up. Can you back it up, Jeremy? Yeah. He besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee. Now he's establishing what he wants. I pray thee, come and lay your hands on her, and she may be healed, and she shall live. That's what he said. That establishes his faith. That's established now. Now, just because you step out there by faith, well, the doctor said I've got a cold, but by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. Now get ready. Get ready. Because just because you said that, and you, you, you established your faith, you might wake up tomorrow and the symptoms might be worse. The, the symptoms could have increased. You could have come to church and somebody says, man, you look terrible. All kinds of obstacles could come against you. You could, you, you could begin to think, well, okay, uh, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. 
bam, it's gone. That doesn't always happen that way. It can. But listen, Jairus established what he wanted. Now, listen, faith is this. If you don't get anything else tonight, let's, let's rehearse the fundamentals. Faith, I'm going to say it right here in the middle. Right here is my faith, okay? Over on my left is the obstacle, the symptoms on my body. My faith says, by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed, okay? I still may not have the manifestation. My nose may still be running, my eyes watering, my throat scratchy. I may feel like, you know, two miles of muddy road. But I'm going to stay right here. I'm not going to go back over here and keep rehearsing the symptoms. Now, I may not have, over here is the manifestation. Symptoms are all gone. I'm totally healed. So, but faith is right here in the center. Faith is the in-between, the these are the symptoms, and I have it. That's when faith makes the stand. This is where I'm standing in faith until I get the results that I want. I established it. She will be healed and she will live. Done deal. Now listen, Mark 11, turn over there real quick, and I, I want you, everybody to see this, so just to remind you of this. Mark 11, 23 and 24. Did we turn some air on, Scott? Okay. Okay, now watch this. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Now watch. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever, okay, that's me, I'm a whosoever. Are you a whosoever? Yes. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith will come to pass, you will have whatever you say. In those scriptures, if you read all of the scriptures and you look at it, the Lord tells you to say or to speak or to say something three times more than he tells you to believe. So it's not what you're believing that's the problem, it's what you're saying. The symptoms are real, and your body is telling you the circumstances are real. But faith says, faith released is, by his stripes I'm healed. That's established. The symptoms must leave based upon what you say. Symptoms leave my body. Leave my body. Then we, we go over and we remember this. Cast down imaginations. And every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God says, Jesus carried sickness and disease. By his stripes I'm healed. The symptoms are real. But I cast those thoughts down. I'm not going to think on those things. I'm going to think on the healing power of God. So I'm not going to think about it. And, and listen, I already said it. I already established it that I am going to be healed. Come and lay your hands on her and she will be healed and she'll live. Now watch this. Let's read this next part very quickly. Go back to Mark chapter 5. Let's look at verse 24. <clears throat> Jesus started to do or act upon his faith-filled words. Right? Verse 24. Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. Now picture this. Jairus is a real man. This is a real story. This is not a parable. He had a real daughter that was at home near unto death. But Jairus said, you come and lay your hands on her and she'll live. Now he said that. Now think about that, if that was you, fathers. Now Jesus is coming to your house and on the way, here comes this woman with the issue of blood. Verse 25 says, there was a woman that had an issue of blood 12 years, suffered many things of many physicians, and spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. She came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I may be touch his garment, I shall be made whole. So here's this woman stopping Jesus while Jairus is trying to get him to his house to lay hands on his daughter. What would you do? Hey, woman, get out of here. My daughter's dying. You, you've already had this 12 years. Just have it for a few more days. Just leave us alone. You see, if you start murmuring and complaining and cursing and, and coming against somebody, you're, what? you're not walking in love. 
And faith works by love, so you better watch your attitude. Jairus established the fact that it doesn't matter if it took Jesus 10 days to get to his house. As soon as Jesus laid hands on him, his daughter was going to be healed. So now this woman, it was illegal for her to even be there. Jairus was the very one, the ruler of the synagogue, had the authority to have her stoned to death. Because she wasn't supposed to be out there. She had an issue of blood and she was not supposed to be in public. Jairus could have called his soldiers and said, Hey guys, arrest that woman, take her out in the woods and stone her. But he didn't do that. Why? He was acting upon his faith and just working and getting Jesus to his house. Let's go on and look at it. I already quoted a lot of it. Let's look at verse uh, 30. Well, let's just go start. Where are we at? Verse, okay, we're in verse 30. Okay, it's Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, fearing and trembling, whew, she was scared because she knew she wasn't supposed to be there. But you know what? When you get to the point where you don't care what anybody else is thinking or doing, you're going to get your answer. She fell down at his feet and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made thee whole. Now, I want you to go back up, if you would, to verse 27. And I want you to see something in verse 27 and 28. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his clothes because she said, she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. Well, why did touching clothes work for her? And Jairus said, come and lay your hands on her. Two different ways of releasing your faith, but it was based upon he was going to get what he said, and she got what she said. And you get what you say. She didn't say, if I could get to Jesus and he lays his hands on me, I'll be made whole. She didn't say that. Her faith was in the testimonies that she had heard. If you read the previous chapters, she had heard testimony where people had gotten healed by touching his clothes. That's where her faith was. In 1982, we moved here to Tulsa, and uh, our little girl was in Sunday school class uh, at Victory Christian Center. We were going to Ramah, and she had gotten bitten by some kind of an insect. We don't know what it was in her arm. I think it was her left arm was all swelled up. Well, in Sunday school class, <clears throat> the church that we went to at that time was at the ORU campus, Victory Christian Center, and the, the city of faith was still there. The fountains were there, the praying hands, and that river of life that they had symbolized was there. Well, she heard testimony in her Sunday school class, she was probably five years old, that a woman from up north had arthritis so bad they had to put her on a stretcher they put her in a van, and her faith was, if you could get me to the city of faith and throw me in that pool, I'll be healed. That was illegal to do that, and the campus security did finally uh, uh, stop the family. But they brought this woman down and put her in that pool of water, and the woman got up out of that water and walked. My daughter heard that. And she came home and she said, will you take me to the city of faith today? Because if I can put my hand in that water, I'll be healed. Now, it was illegal to do that. They didn't want you doing that. But you know what? We said, sure. So get in the truck. We didn't know that she was talking about the river of life that came out of the praying hands. We took her to Christ Chapel where they have all different types of pools there. And we took her up by the Christ Chapel up the hill. And there was that one pool there. And uh, yeah, it, the water was down low for some reason. So we took her and picked her up by her ankles and held her over there, and she put her arm in that water and pulled her arm out, and it was totally healed. She put her faith in that as a five-year-old kid. And when we went back there as adults, she, uh, uh, her husband said, take me and show me that pool of water where Nikki got healed. He wanted to see it. You see, that's not magic water. 
I'm sure that water had been changed many times before she stuck her hands in it. But her faith was there. Do you understand what I'm saying to you today? The woman said, if I can touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. He said, come and lay your hands on her and she'll live. The Lord says, you can have what you say. When you say it, it establishes it. As long as you don't take it back and say something else. But if you say, by his stripes I'm healed, and man, I'm sure sick. Which, what are you establishing? Which one do you want? To be sick or to be well? Notice that all of these obstacles came against Jesus and Jairus' faith, but he didn't change his confession. Watch this, verse 35. Jeremy, I got you bouncing all over, buddy. You're doing a good job. Verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house. How many of you know there are good Christian people that aren't walking where you're walking, and they're going to say things that can rain on your parade? You know what I mean by that? You all understand that, or is that just a Yankee term? I could say, in Oklahoma, it's going to wind on your parade. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> But there are going to be people that they don't mean to, but they challenge, they challenge your faith. They challenge it. They don't mean to, but they, just, they, they think they're just carrying on a general conversation. If you're going to be a person of faith, you cannot participate in those general conversations. Now, I did this, and I didn't, this just happened about two weeks ago or whatever. I don't mean to insult people, but I want to work my faith. And, and I fell, and I, I'm not going to tell you who this was because I don't want to embarrass them, but they know who it is. And uh, I fell and broke my tailbone. They did x-rays and said it was severed and there was no way they could heal it. And so I established my faith. I said, I got an orthopedic surgeon living on the inside of me. How many of you know where I get that scripture from? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Jesus is living in me. I'm born again. So I got an orthopedic surgeon living on the inside of me. Well, a couple of people found out that I had fallen and broken my tailbone. I came to church on a Wednesday night, and somebody walked up to me and said, how's your tailbone? I said, I got an orthopedic surgeon living on the inside of me, bless God. He said, okay, gave me knuckles and walked away. But you see, for four or five days, that's all that came out of my mouth. I sat on a hemorrhoid tube and all of the, everything I could do, I laid down, took care of it, did, you know, nurtured it, relaxed. But every time I thought of the pain, I said the same thing. I got an orthopedic surgeon living on the inside of me. Now, I established that, and I said that because when they took the x-ray, they said, there's nothing we can do for you. There's nothing that we can do for you. Bless God, if medical science can't do anything, then it's between me and the Almighty God. He created me, and he's on the inside of me. And i got to tell you guys, I am, this is not a faith confession. There's no pain. It's totally healed. It's totally gone. I mean, well, is the bone back in place? I don't know. I'm not going to go get it x-rayed. I don't care. I don't care if that bone's up here. I really don't care where it is. <laughs> I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. But Jairus established his faith. Come and lay your hands on my daughter and she will live. All right, now watch this. While he yet spake, there came from him the ruler of the synagogue's house. Your daughter is dead. Now, we read this and we don't think, well, what if that was your daughter? What would you do? Man, I'm going to get me a hit squad. I'm going to go kill that woman with the issue of blood. If she wouldn't have gotten away, Jesus would have got there in time and my daughter wouldn't have died. Bless God, I'm, this is it. I'm done. I'm not serving God anymore. These stupid religious people in the church always get him. I mean, what would you have done? Somebody parked in my parking spot tonight at church. I'm never going back there again. <clears throat> I think church people will test your love walk more than anybody. <laughs> when we were wanting to, uh, <clears throat> we were wanting to leave Michigan and we were wanting to uh, <clears throat> sell our resort, we were learning these things, and so we wrote down, thank you, Scott, it's cooling down in here now. Um, we, were, we wrote down what we wanted, that we were going to sell the resort, we were going to go to Ramah, 
And we, we established that. And back in 1981, the economy was really, really bad in Michigan. Somebody told me that there was a sign on the interstate going down the one interstate out of Michigan into Indiana. Said there was a sign there that said, the last one out of Michigan, turn off the lights. That's how bad the economy was. I didn't see that sign, but somebody told me it was there because I didn't go out that interstate. But so we established the fact we're going to sell our resort. We established it. And so we started playing games with it. We started confessing it. You know, hey, resort, we don't want you anymore. You belong to somebody else. Now, this may sound silly to you, but this is what we heard. This is what we read, that we can have what we say. So we just kept saying that. And so we were going to church, and they would have different uh, activities at different people's homes. And the pastor came to us and said, we would like you to have an activity at your home. And we said, well, uh, we can't, pastor. We're moving. And one person heard us say that, and they said, you said that last year. Well, you want to try to be polite. Or you, what do you say? Yeah, you're right. This isn't working. You can't sell anything in Michigan. Everything's going broke. Nobody can't sell. No. We just said, well, go ahead, sign us up, but we're not going to be here. So they signed us up and put a date down there. And, and our, our confession was this. We didn't list it with a realtor. We, did, we, we followed the instructions of the Lord. And we kept playing this game. Well, one day, uh, that phone's going to ring and somebody's just going to ask us if we want to sell the resort. And so we'd answer the phone and it wasn't that right, it wasn't that person. And then pretty soon people started finding out that we were wanting to sell the resort and our friends and, oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, well, whatever, whatever, whatever. We just never let it change us. We just kept, you know, in our, in our home, we just kept saying, one of the days, one of these days, the phone is going to ring and somebody's going to want to buy the resort. We kept our confession established. That's what I'm trying to get to you. One day I was walking through the office. Our office was connected to the kitchen and, and I was walking through the kitchen. I walked by the phone and the phone rang and I was getting ready to go upstairs and I told Pastor Dorothy, I said, answer the phone, that person wants to buy the resort. That was on a Tuesday. She answered the phone and said, Hans Resort. People said, would you be interested in selling your resort? And what do you think she said? No, let me pray about it. She said, yeah. And it's really, you don't want to advertise that you're selling a business. Did you know that if you advertise you're selling a business, you can lose clientele? So I don't know, that was the wisdom of God. But anyway, they said, all right, we want to come and look at it. Now, I don't know if you've ever bought a home or not, but you know it takes 30, 60, 90 days to, to do all the paperwork and the inspections and to close on it and to sell it and get everybody all lined up. I think you can get it done in 30 days maybe. Uh, in Michigan, it took a lot longer. Sometimes it took three months. But they came out on Tuesday, looked at the resort, called back the next day and said, we'd like to come and make an offer. Came out on Thursday. We sat at our kitchen table. I got a legal pad, still got the contract, wrote it out on contract, the terms of the sale of the resort, and he signed it, and we moved Saturday. I mean, the devil didn't have a chance to get in there and know anything. It was a done deal. It was established, but we, it seemed like that just happened in four days, Pastor. No, it was a, a, a year and a half in four days. We established it, and we kept it established above all circumstances. Now watch this. Go back to verse 35 again. They came to him and said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Now watch this. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. Don't say anything, J.R. Just stay with what you have established. Guys, if you want circumstances to change, this is the principle that's going to get it done. This is what's going to get it done. Now, I've got to t I want to tell you this other testimony. That happened <clears throat> with this tailbone situation, and it was a, a matter of, and I don't remember the exact journal, it was about over a two-week period, but after I found out and I went and had it x-rayed, it was only about four days 
It was from Monday through Friday. By Friday, I was totally healed. But now, listen to me. Don't you guys, I don't, I'm not saying this to, for you guys to come up and question me. You understand? I'm just telling you so that you can understand things. There's something else that I have been believing in my body for, for almost two years. Why hasn't that manifest yet, Pastor? I don't know. I don't know that answer, but I know it's established, and I know it's coming, and I don't care how long it takes, I'm not moving off of it. Amen. I'm not moving. You don't know about it. You'll never know about it. Nobody knows about it. My wife heard about it a couple years ago, probably forgot about it by now. Why? Because I don't get up every morning and say, Honey, we believe God with me because this thing ain't going away. No, you don't have the luxury of saying that. I established the fact that it's healed. So now because of what I learned about, and we've been studying this, I think the Lord was preparing all of us, and especially me. We've learned about the name of Jesus, that I'm in him and he's in me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And then I heard that testimony from Creflo Dollar, how he got healed of that prostate cancer. Uh, because he said, there, uh, there's a man living on the inside of me. Well, I took that a little more personal. There's an orthopedic surgeon living on the inside of me. And, and boy, you don't know the days I get up and I say, man, I got a, I, I, I got a cardiologist living on the inside of me. Man, I got an orthodontist living on the inside of me. I, I got an obst optometrist living on the inside of me. I got a neurologist living on the inside of me. He's in there. He made this body, and he knows how to take care of it. Amen. And that's what I've been doing lately. Whew. Are you listening? Now watch this. Jesus said, only believe, verse 37. And when he suffered no man to follow him, except Peter, James, John, and the brother, of J the brother of James. He came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he heard them crying or wailing and moaning and groaning because of the death of the daughter. And he heard them weeping, and they were wailing greatly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why are you making this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but she's sleeping. They laughed him to scorn, now watch what Jesus had to do to get this daughter up out of the dead. But when he had put them all out, he threw them out of the room. Why? You got to get that doubt and unbelief out. All that wailing, moaning, and groaning, and bawling, and squalling, and all that crying and stuff. Listen, guys, that doesn't move God. Jesus threw them out. He put them all out. He took the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, his three disciples, and he entered in where the damsel was lying. He took the damsel by her hand and he said unto her, Telethakumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And immediately the damsel arose and she walked. She was about 12 years old. They were astonished with great astonishment, and he charged them that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Do you see what happened? Do you understand this? It was established that if Jesus would lay his hands on her, she would live. Amen. Now, uh, I was having coffee with Buddy the other day, and we were sitting there talking. Him and I come from a little bit of the same background. He's a hunter, and I'm a hunter. And of course, he was a farmer. I was not a farmer. But we hunted. And we did a lot of the same. Any other hunters in here? Any deer hunters in here besides me? A couple deer hunters. I don't know how you guys did it, but in Michigan, deer hunting was a big deal. I mean, they shut the schools down opening day because they knew the teachers weren't going to be in school. They were going to be hunting. That's how, it, it was a big deal. I mean, you could see it wa like wagon trains heading north to the woods. I mean, we go two days early so we could get up and get set up in the woods. But the way that I did it, and my brother-in-law, him and I would go together, we would practice all summer long. We had our rifles, and I would take my rifle out of the rack periodically, and I'd get my rifle out, and I'd I'd practice. I'd practice drawing in. I'd practice getting the scope. I'd practice on targets. I would practice. I would sit there, practice taking that safety off so it was real quiet. 
because the deer got good ears. And I had my special deer hunting bag where I had my clothes in my deer hunting bag with apple scent in there, so my deer hunting clothes would smell like apples. I didn't use them to grease my motors and stuff like that. Those were my deer hunting clothes. And we would go to the rifle range and we would practice. Not just get on the 100-yard range and put it in sandbags. and pre- I don't have sandbags out in the woods. You understand? i got to shoot like this. Or I may have to shoot like this. Or, you know, this was the tough one, trying to shoot. Man, that doesn't work. So you got to be facing the right way when the deer comes out. But we used to practice and we used to stand. If the target was down there, we would stand with our back toward it. And my brother-in-law would say, there he is. And I'd turn around and shoot and see how many times I could hit that target at 100 yards. I had a five-shot automatic. And then we got the idea that we're going to put the target in a tire and we're going to roll the tire down the hill and shoot at that thing moving. How many times does a deer come out and say, here I am? I mean, we used to, I used to have a 22 rifle that I practiced trying to light stick matches with. I got to tell you, I never did light one, but I sure did clip the heads of them off quite. A... But I got really good. I got really proficient. But all of that practice, time after time after time, and sitting down and practicing with that rifle and loading that rifle, learning to load it, making sure that the chamber was loaded, making sure that the shell was in there, cleaning the rifle, all of that preparation and all my hunting clothes and all of that that time that I prepared. And where I went, it wasn't like going at a a deer ranch where you sit there and let's say, oh, I don't want that 12 point. I'm waiting for a 14 point. No, I don't want that. I want this big one. No, where I go, if you see a deer, I, I was six years hunting before I ever saw one. I was beginning to wonder if there was a deer in this woods. I mean, you're sitting out there below zero weather, freezing and teeth chattering. We didn't have heated blinds back then. We're sitting out there in the woods day after day after day, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And it all boils down to this. When a deer starts coming through, you may or you may not see it before it's in your view. We couldn't bait them back then, so we didn't have bait piles. I mean, it was all natural Woods, I mean swamp, 30 miles of rough swamp. And you're sitting out there freezing. Your hands are so cold you can't hardly pull. I didn't get to practice frozen fingers pulling the trigger. But it all boils down to this. When you do finally see a deer, you've got to do everything that you practiced. I mean, your heart's beating so fast. I mean, you, you're, you're, you, you get the rifle up there, you got to do it real slow, make sure the deer's looking the other way, make sure his ears are the right way, make sure his tail's not up. you got to make sure everything's got to be just right. It all comes right down to all of this practice comes down to about a 10-second shot. About 10 seconds. And there are times when I had less than 10 seconds where it's all got to be right. Now, up where I went hunting and where my relatives are, you don't miss. If you miss, you, you know not a lie. You know what a lie is? A lie is an abomination to God and a blessing in a time of trouble. <laughs> but where my relatives, if you miss, I took Pastor Jason there from Oklahoma, and I took him up there, and he had never deer hunted like this before. And we sat him. He had a nice little runway, and then you could bait the pile. And, and the deer came out there. And now we're about five miles from my uncle's house, about probably eight or ten miles from town. We're out in the middle of the swamp. I don't know how this happens, but before you get to town, the whole world knows whether you got a deer or not. So Pastor Jason got a shot at a deer, and he missed it. So we were going to my uncle's house that night for supper, and my uncle heard that he shot at a deer and missed it. Oh, my God, you think you're going to hell if you miss a deer. And so my uncle's sitting there, and he said, son, he said, uh, you know you're out there where the bear are, don't you? Jason says, yeah, my dad told me all about the bear and all that. He said, well, let me tell you, I don't know if your dad told you this or not, but he said, let me tell you how to shoot a bear. So Jason's listening. You know Jason, he's real humble, he's real teachable. So he's sitting there, he said, Uncle Wally, go ahead and tell me. So my uncle said, now when he's coming towards you, he said, just sit real quiet, sit real still. And let him get real close to you. 
is don't, don't, don't do anything. But when he stands up and he opens his mouth, stick the gun in his mouth and shoot. That way you won't miss. That's my relatives. So I learned if I'm out in the woods and I shoot, I don't tell anybody if I miss. But it all comes right down to this. Now, guys, I want to close with telling you this. My rifle, the rifle that I had, had a magazine and you loaded four shells. And I know you women don't like the deer hunt. I'm not, I'm not killing Bambi. I don't hunt right now. But you load four shells in the magazine and then you put one in the chamber. All right? Now, the first rifle that I had, it, had, it was a lever action, and you, you put the shells in the side of it, and it would, you could load six of them in the magazine, all six of them. Then you racked one in the chamber, and you were ready to go. So now here I am, all ready to go, got my rifle loaded, I'm sitting in my stand, a deer walks out, get my rifle pulled up, all things being equal, there's the deer, and he just walks on by. I did everything perfect. What happened? Why did that deer walk away? I loaded my shells. I practiced. I had the scope on him. It was a perfect shot. He was standing there, looked perfectly at me, and just walked away. All this preparation. I've got all the right shells, I've got all the right equipment, the right shot, the right environment, and I didn't get the deer. What happened? I didn't pull the trigger. So you sit here, Wednesday after Wednesday, Sunday after Sunday, you study the healing scriptures, you're loading yourself up, you're building up the faith, you've got all of this faith, and the doctor says, you got cancer, you're going to die. The deer walks out and he looks at you, here I am. When the doctor says, now when that doctor told me, I mean, she had a horrible look on her face, guys. I'll never forget that look, but I had to get past that look. She said, not only is your tailbone broken, it is severed, and it's off to the side. We can't do anything for you. She almost cried. I said to her, she said, you may want to see an orthopedic surgeon. I'm thinking, you just told me it can't be fixed. I got a lightning fast mind. And I looked at her, all that fear on her face, and I looked at her, and I said, that'll never happen. I said, I'll get this. Why? I pulled the trigger. All that faith, all this study, and all this preparation, everything that I've done. Bless God, when they give you the evil report back in 2003, that doctor came out and told me, go home and get your chair, house wheelchair ready. Right there in that office in front of the nurse and everybody that was standing there, I said, I got a healer that knows more than that. I'll be healed. I'll never be crippled. Why? I pulled the trigger. Stand on your feet. What's the trigger? By his stripes, I'm healed. When hands are laid upon me, I believe I receive. When I'm anointed with oil, I get the manifestation. Cancer, you leave. You cannot stay on me. Do you all get anything out of this? Amen. Guys, pull the trigger. Amen. Now, there's one thing. And Renee will tell you this. Scott's out in the foyer watching. Whenever you pull the trigger, and you, sometimes you could tell if you didn't quite squeeze it just right. Can you say, wait a minute. Shall come back here. I need to redo this. Once you release it, it's a done deal. So the doctor says, this is an incurable cancer. Oh, no, I'm going to die. You just shot. A shot that's going to put you in the grave. So you release your faith. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the Holy Ghost of God. Thank you, Lord, that you look over your word to perform it. And that as we establish our faith by releasing that trigger, 
we know that it'll be done in Jesus' name. If you got anything out of this, say amen. amen. You're dismissed. Come join us at New Beginnings Family Church, located in Mustang, Oklahoma, at 1615 East State Highway 152. You can find us online on Facebook and YouTube or at walkbyfaith.info. To contact us, call 405-261-6887. And remember, you don't need a second chance. You need a new beginning.